that is absolutely a terrible look for the trucking company to have to, you know, to get there and immediately prioritize things and property instead of human life. Whether you're at fault, whether you're not at fault, I mean, the human life has to be valued above everything else. Welcome to The Defense Never Rests with Morgan and Akins, your monthly dose of uncommon sense about all things legal and some that are not. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of The Defense Never Rests. Uh, I'm Megan Henry, and I'm joined again today with my my partner and co-host, Oliver Brooks. Good morning, Oliver. How are you? Good morning. Good. How about you? Good. So today we have on Rebecca Gregg, who's a senior claims specialist at Napa River Insurance. Um, and we are going to talk about catastrophic trucking claims and what you need to do uh, you know, starting day one. And this is something that, you know, she's kind of speaking mine and Oliver's language. So, um, you know, Oliver deals with these types of claims all the time. And, you know, I think it's a, you know, really good and helpful discussion of like what you need to do when you get the call of, you know, a fatality or something terrible happening with one of your clients. So as always, if you like what you hear, uh, like, and subscribe and come back for more. So good morning, Rebecca. Welcome to this episode of The Defense Never Rests. Uh, we are here to talk about today what to do when you get a uh, like a catastrophic high exposure claim on, on day one. Um, but before we dive in, uh, I just want to get, you know, talk to you a little bit, get a little background on you. So you are a claim special specialist at Napa River Insurance, which is not in Napa Valley. So I've learned. <laughs> Sadly, no. <laughs> We're in Indianapolis. <laughs> little different, a little different uh, <laughs> environment there, but has, even so. So what does Napa River Insurance do? Napa River Insurance is a third-party administrator. We are a part of Hudson Insurance. And what we do is we offer very specialized sort of boutique claim services for large self-insured trucking companies. So my role as a uh, claim specialist is that I have a direct relationship with my clients who are the trucking companies and I handle all of their claims that fall within their self-insured retention. And so that could be everything. So it might be a smaller loss, but often involves you know bodily injury, litigation, but it's all trucking all the time. <laughs> Um, so we do get a lot of catastrophic losses like this, and sometimes you um, just have to scramble and, and get started and uh, roll up your sleeves. So I thought this would be a, a great first topic for us to talk about what you do when that call comes in. Yes. And, and a, as, a, as an aside, I think we, you might be a regular guest on the Defense Never Rest because we have a <laughs> lot of good topics to talk about, but this is a good starting point. Um, <laughs> so having that specialized relationship with your, your clients, you know, what sort of advice do you give them? Because it's a whole different breed of clients that you have. I mean, they have very specific risks and mm -hmm. very high exposure risks. So do you counsel them a, a little bit differently than you would say like a, a not a trucking client about, you know, risk prevention? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's a relationship more than your typical insured insurance company sort of relationship because I have, I think 11 direct clients and we get to know each other very well. I know a lot of insurance companies that handle trucking claims. You might have a team of people that you work with and you might not know who you're going to get, but they always know that they're going to call me. And, and so we get to know each other really well. And we have a lot of opportunities to have those conversations because when you have a self-insured retention and most of my clients have somewhere between 50,000 and 2 million, they've got a lot of skin in the game and they're very involved in the decision-making process. So, you know, it, it's my job with my experience in claims to, to handle the claims, but also to counsel them on and give the best advice I can about how we can be most effective in using their money and getting good outcomes and in claims and litigation. And they are much, much more involved than your typical insured. And they're savvy too. I mean, when you run a large trucking company and when you are, are going to bet on yourself and have that much confidence to take on ownership of, of that retention that you have, then you really have to know what you're doing. And our clients do. They're tech savvy. Um, they are, they've got dash cams. They've got the good technology. They've got um, their, everything on their trucks as far as ECMs and downloads that we need. They 
more importantly, I think, understand the current climate that is going on with trucking litigation today. I'm talking about nuclear verdicts, um, reptile theory and how to combat it. Um, they get it and they understand what they need to do as far as working a claim towards a, a good resolution. And they don't really get hung up on making things for decisions um, on principle um, just because they're upset about the result or the perception they get it. So yeah, it's definitely a, a different kind of relationship, but I, I think it's a, a wonderful way that insurance companies and the insurers can be partners together and work together to get good outcomes. And, and it's, and in a way, I mean, it can make litigation or approaching litigation a much more symbiotic relationship because you're, you're working together uh, and when they under, when your clients understand what they're up against, it, it's one easier to prepare and then easier to navigate when you're working with someone who's, you know, familiar with the process, but that doesn't make it uh, foolproof, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes there are hard pills to swallow, you know, like, for example, we're going to talk about catastrophic losses. And one thing, you know, spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you is that anytime you have a very serious accident, especially an accident involving a fatality, a serious injury, first thing we're going to do is get defense counsel on the file. And for a trucking company who's footing the bill for these expenses, knowing that, well, even if it seems completely apparent that we're not at fault, we're going to have to expect to spend about fifteen to $20,000 probably just to cover our bases as far as our initial investigation, our evidence preservation and things like that. It's one of the first conversations that I have with my clients about how we handle things. And um, they understand, fortunately, that these things are just necessary because as we know, no claim goes the way that you expect that it's going to go. So um, yeah, it, it can be difficult to have those conversations, but it's important to be frank and to look at uh, what your situation is honestly and not just a, a, a wish list for how you think it's going to happen or, or hopeful thinking. They've got too much money in the game to you know, really leave that to chance. They need to be proactive and they need to be um, very strategic about how they uh, defend that. And, and you kind of segued into the, what I was going to talk about. So you, you know, you get the call, uh, you know, middle of the night call that there's a catastrophic loss. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, in, in my eyes, the first thing that you, you'd want to do is get counsel on board and at the scene. Is that the first step or one of the first steps that, that you would take? Absolutely. That's the first thing that I try to do. So um, there are two calls really that I'm going to make right away. It's to defense counsel and to, I want to get a boots on the ground field adjuster, get someone out there right away. Now you could probably ask a lot of claims adjusters and they might be torn about what the right order to do that. I feel like I need a, a family feud board <laughs> behind me. Like we surveyed a hundred claims adjusters <laughs> about who to call and, and here are the top five answers. So um, some people are going to say, call your boots on the ground field adjuster right away. I disagree. Your first call, I think, needs to be to your attorney. So the reason that I say you do that is they've, they've got experience. They have the experts and it protects your work product. Um, I, I know that you know people might think that, oh, this is taking time away. I need to get something in motion now while this scene is hot, but your attorney gets it. It's a quick call. You give them the information they need so they can run their their checks um, to make sure they don't have any conflicts, um, see if they have a recommendation as far as experts, because they might know somebody, um, you know, who's really good, who's close by, who has a good relationship with the authorities and things in the area that they can get out there right away. But it's a quick call, call your attorney, get them started on that, and then make the, the boots on the ground call to your adjuster. Now, for me, I like to get in touch with my field adjuster, wherever it is. And it could be anywhere in the company, in the country. So it's probably not gonna be me. I'm not gonna be able to get to the scene, but um, get in touch with my field adjuster attorney and give them just the information they need to get them there and get started. But as far as who's going to be directing this, I wanna get them in touch with my attorney right away. So that way that we have our defense attorney who is, um, sort of guiding this investigative process that they have. Um, now, 
again, since I handle claims all over the country, um, you know, I want to make sure that I get one, the right attorney for the job. You know, I, I do trucking. So I'm looking for someone who understands transportation and, and trucking claims. Um, fortunately, I've been doing this long enough that I know in most places of the country, I know exactly who I'm going to call. If, if it's in Philly, if it's in Indy, Chicago, Atlanta, Dallas, Louisville, I already, they're on my phone <laughs> and I'm calling them immediately and I know who they are. Um, if it's an unfamiliar area for me, well, you know, I have a lot of peers who are knowledgeable, who can give me a recommendation, um, not to mention a pretty extensive network on, on LinkedIn where I can reach out. There are a lot of people there. So if I need a transportation defense attorney, you know, in Nebraska and South Dakota, and I don't have somebody there, um, it's pretty easy to find one quickly so they can hit the ground running. So for me, yeah, I, and, okay. I would agree with you. You got to call us first because yeah. <laughs> not only because we want, we want the work, but um, uh, <laughs> because we have, uh, you know, we have already a, a library of, uh, of experts that we can, we can get that ball rolling immediately. I, I guess it was going on about 18 months ago. We, we had a situation like that where one of Megan's clients called uh, Megan to say we, we just had a, a, a fatal trucking accident um, literally like 20 minutes ago. Um, what, what can you do? Megan was, I forget if you were on trial or what the, the case was, but you, you called me and I kind of ran with it. I was able to get a... Um, uh, and a well-established expert that I have actually, you know, his name in my phone as well. I just called him. I said, Hey man, can you get out there? He said, you know, it's, it's a six hour drive for me, but if I leave, you know, around midnight, we can be there by first light and we'll, we'll uh, get the scene inspected. And because we got there quick enough, we we're able to take, uh, we preserved the, the video of the scene because it happened in a, a parking lot. Mm -hmm. We got, uh, six witness statements, uh, some of which were good, some were not so good. Um, and uh, we also were able to document uh, what I will call ephemeral type evidence that was on uh, uh, at the scene. And by that, I mean stuff that is biological on the ground. Um, uh, it was pretty, pretty gruesome. Uh, and I think that had we waited even a day or two, you know, the, the forces of nature would have just washed all that away. Yep. Um, we had another one where a, uh, a, a truck struck a pedestrian on a country road and killed him. And it, it happened during a very light snowstorm and the road was clear, but the side of the road had just this faint, like powdered donut dusting of snow and we were able to get out there quickly enough to establish the pedestrians tracks in the snow and interestingly it, they led right to a bar and interestingly we found out that he had been thrown out for being drunk and it turned into a dram shop case not against us mm -hmm. so it was a very uh, very different perspective had we been even a couple of hours later, I don't think that evidence would have been there. I was going to say, it's you all about call us. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all about getting getting out there and getting your feet on the ground and get your attorney out there early to start controlling the narrative and getting the, the evidence that you need right off the bat and talking to everyone you need at the right of the bottom. It just, it, it, you, you're already starting you know, a hundred feet ahead than if you were to come a day later, two days later, months later. Um, so, I mean, I think it's really important and you can, you can, even though your, your clients have to spend this money up front that sometimes is a hard pill to swallow. It might always be a hard pill to swallow. The long, the long-term ramifications of spending that up front can save them so much when you can start, you know, piecing the puzzle together at, you know, hour, you know, hour two. So, you know, um, so, you know, you get, you get your attorney and you get your, your field adjuster out there, you get your, your experts out there, um, you know, and, you know, we're here to talk about what, what are you tell you know, what are you telling young claims adjusters how to handle this? So you, we got step one, what's step two? Well, step two, I think starts once the investigator gets to the scene. So the first thing that I want my investigator to do is is find the driver and lock him down. 
Um, find the officer, assist him. We want to be cooperative. We want to show that we have nothing to hide. We want to, um, if we are taking measurements, pictures, things like that, if we have dash cam, we, uh, we want to foster an air cooperation and, and share this um, with the officers there. One good thing about if your defense attorney has has a person in the area um, that they know that they can send out on the field and get them there while the scene is hot, while things are going on. That's always my goal to get out there as soon as possible is often these people are local and the emergency responders might be familiar with them. They've worked with them before. They've built a reputation for transparency. They've built a professional relationship with the emergency responders. Um, and all of that can go a long way into fostering cooperation and sort of shaping um, how this situation is going to play out as far as how we're able to get information from the police, the access that we're going to have to the victims. And it's not just the police that we want them to get in touch with. Obviously, witnesses right away, you want to be able to track down as many as you can. Sometimes they're favorable, as, as Oliver mentioned, sometimes they're not. We still need to know that because later on, you know, after we've you know, gotten out there and investigated everything, we're going to have to take a good hard look at all of the evidence we gather and get a honest assessment of what our strengths and what our weaknesses is. You know, it's, it's not going to be a wish list. It's not going to be what, what we want to happen. It, you know, we have to pull our heads out of the sand a little bit sometimes and take a, a good honest look and look at the things that might be favorable for us and might be unfavorable for us so we can get to work on working towards the best possible outcome for that. So talk to the witnesses, talk to the tow truck drivers. Um, I wanna lock down the vehicles. I want all the information that we have on the vehicles, VIN numbers, license plate numbers. I wanna know where they're going. And I want either our field adjuster or if they don't do that, get another appraiser out as soon as possible to do an inspection of all of the vehicles, uh, photos, evaluation. Um, and, and we'll be talking with our attorney too about what makes sense as far as downloads. Since I deal in, in tractor trailers, obviously there's a lot more technology than there might be on your average private passenger vehicle. So we'll have a conversation if it makes sense to do an ECM or EDR download, what kind of data we need to pull in, what kind of experts we need to pull in to, to get that information. Um, scene photos um, is also super, super important, not just the vehicles, but like you mentioned, the snow, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of pedestrians this year. I've, I've had a lot of bad ones, a lot of pedestrians. I had a, a similar one. It wasn't a liquor shop. Um, it was a casino. And um, so by getting that information soon um, to the scene and being able to find nearby surveillance videos that tracked the car going from the casino, going the wrong way down the highway, hitting us head on now it's turning you know it, there wasn't really anything that we could do we might get we might get dragged into it but this is uh, now we've got information on the casino that we might not have known before if our field investigator hadn't done that work and hadn't gone canvassing and, and been able to find that video and the other information for us um another one of thing the things i was gonna to sort of add to you know if, if i were to counsel somebody early on is uh don't value the cargo above the uh, individuals who are involved in this incident. I recently was, was uh, sharing a, a beverage with one of my buddies who works on the, the other side of litigation, uh, and he was involved in representing the uh, widow of a, uh, of, a, of a guy who was killed by a tractor trailer that basically cut his car into multiple pieces mm -hmm. and the uh, claims adjuster on the other side for the for the trucking company was so con concerned about getting the cargo uh, to the big box store because it was two days before Christmas that there was absolutely no it, what all came out was the uh, all of their communications were recorded there was no communication about is this guy okay is he alive is he dead what's going on it was get the TVs to the you know the I won't say the name of the, the big store but uh, we got to get this and they, they actually counseled this driver to leave the scene by about a mile unhook his his uh, trailer and then bring the tractor back. And 
that drove the value of that case so unbelievably high. It went from bad to, oh boy, you know, um, cause it's, it's, it, 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 I don't know if it's technically punitive, but it has the effect of being punitive. Um, so that's just, I mean, I don't think that happens very often. I think most people have a, you know, something between their two ears to understand that the TVs can wait. That is absolutely a terrible look for the trucking company to have to, you know, to get there and immediately prioritize things and property instead of human life. Whether you're at fault, whether you're not at fault, I mean, the human life has to be valued above everything else. And when, for me, trucking companies especially, but an, an insured who, who may be at fault is already kind of fighting um, the perception that a jury may have um, as far as their, their reaction. If they're a commercial entity and, you know, they just, just look like, oh, they're they're just some business and they don't care about people and all they care about is their TVs and their cargo and stuff like that. I mean, juries are going to want to punish them for that because that, that is not the, the good look. You want to be able to humanize your insured, humanize your trucking company, humanize your bus company or corporation, whatever it is. So um, having an empathetic response right from the beginning um, is, is a good start to being able to do that and cutting down on those punitive damages that they may face later. Not a good look. <laughs> and I think it also goes yeah. to yeah. the company's own um, response to their own employee driver and providing that, that driver the, the services that they may need. They might need psycho like psychological services after being involved in a fatality. I mean, I had, you know, one not so long ago that, you know, he, this driver didn't even, first didn't even know he had struck anyone then was searching for that person totally distraught they could, he couldn't find them um eventually the 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 individual was found in a field um but the the company provided him with you know all these psychological services for the you know for the impact it had on on him and i think that spoke volumes to how the company as a whole how they treat their employees as well as the re, you know the response to the the incident and just Absolutely. keep them from talking for for a little while. <laughs> cool, cool down. I mean, just it, it, you're not going to get in any more trouble if you take an hour or two and have a cup of coffee and a breath, you know, and and determine what's happening because we see so often that a, a striking driver, the first thing out of their mouth is, "I'm sorry." And then that gets twisted into some sort of admission of fault, which it, it's not that you bump into somebody and you say, I'm sorry, you don't, you don't think about, was it my fault that, uh, that this happened or was it his fault? You know, it's just, excuse me type of a thing. So just, I always just tell them to sit in your truck, take a breath, don't talk until I tell you to. And we'll, you know, of course, if cops come up and say, what's your name? Uh, where do you live? You got to give them that stuff, but right. just, I've never had a situation where the police have been like, if you don't start telling us, we're putting you in cuffs right now. Unless, of course, the guy is, uh, you know, maybe intoxicated or something. That could be a different story. But, um, you know, a quote, uh, an honest accident. I've never had a, a situation where starting the narrative, you know, in the, the midst of an adrenaline rush is a great idea. Yes, exactly. And this is... Um... One thing I wanted to, to talk about now that you mentioned that is how our boots on the ground adjuster and how our defense attorney can best serve our driver immediately after the accident. Um, I, I've worked for big box insurance companies before this. I, I won't name them, but um, usually the investigative process at those insurance companies is, is a little bit different. They wanna get somebody out there. They wanna get a recorded statement right away with everyone. The first time I want my driver ever giving a recorded statement, if he does it at all, is during his deposition after he has been thoroughly prepared by our defense attorney. There is absolutely no need to get a recorded statement from your driver at the scene of the accident when then all of this is going on. The, the trauma is real. I've had drivers you know, who never drove again after something like this or needed counseling. And you know, that's absolutely valid. We should be finding the best ways that we can to support them. 
Um, I usually try to call them and let them know that we've got an attorney assigned, that they're going to be hearing from them. I'll have the attorney, you know, do the, the interview, but first we're going to make sure they get to a safe place. I'm going to have my appraiser give them a ride somewhere. If they need a ride to a hotel, if they need post-accident drug screening or something like that, then they'll take them there and just make sure that they're not alone in this because um, we just need to tend to those needs first and not jump into the like, you know, recording them and tell us where you were and things like that. We're going to be able to get all of the information we need about what happened from the accident, from our scene investigator, from talking with the police, from talking with the witnesses. I, I can't caution enough. There's just never ever a reason to do a recorded statement with your driver following the accident, especially right at right on the day of the accident at the scene. Don't do it, <laughs> please. <laughs> I agree. It's <laughs> very good advice. <laughs> so. um, and you had mentioned earlier about lock, you know, locking, getting vehicles off the road and locking down the vehicles. And I couldn't agree more with that as well. I think there, the issue you often that comes into play is, you know, the the larger, more sophisticated um, trucks. I think the companies will do that. But then, if it's involved in an accident of a smaller, st still commercial vehicle, sometimes they they don't abide by the locking the car, locking the truck down rules yep. a, as well. Um, and I've had this happen in, in cases before that, you know, I'll, I'll call them. And they're like, oh, wait, that, that's already back on the road. And I was like, did you not see yep. the preservation letter <laughs> that I had sent? <laughs> um, but second with that is the data. Um, you know, I, I think there's a struggle as, as to when is the appropriate time to pull the data. Mm -hmm. I, I always err on the side of over abundance of caution and just have the, park the vehicle, don't move it and don't pull the data until uh, there's count, a more other counsel for the other side is involved. So I don't get accused of any spoilation arguments, but then there's often, I find that you can get pressure from the trucking company that they want to be able to get their truck back on the road too. And you have it, you know, sidelined because you don't want anything to happen with the data. Um, have you run into some of these, these issues as well? Oh, we <laughs> <laughs> yes. Here's the answer. They're not going to like it. We can't move the truck. We can't turn the truck back on. It's going to have to stay there for a while. Um, one thing, one tip I can give claims adjusters um, is have your field adjuster reach out to the tow company and right at the beginning, negotiate some long-term storage. <clears throat> Let your insured know it's necessary. We can't turn off the vehicle. We have to make it available for the other side to come and inspect it. We're going to want to do downloads, but you know, if it's a if it's a bad loss, odds are, you know, 99 times out of 100, you're going to be getting a rep letter from the other side, and then you can very quickly have your defense counsel get in touch with opposing counsel to coordinate these inspections, so they can both be there at the same time. They can observe each other. Nobody can accuse each other of doing anything they're not supposed to be doing. Everything we can make sure that it's within the scope of what we wanted them to do, but the truck's just going to have to be there for a while. And now, if you're lucky, um, you might be able to get in touch with them soon. And if maybe set a two week window if, if they're open to it, but 30 days generally is how long I'm gonna expect your truck to be locked down minimum. Um, if in, in that time, if you've got a driver, you've got an owner operator, um, you know, try to keep them cooperative, see if there's something that you can do, a desk job, something that you can do to keep them off the road, especially if you're investigating, especially if there's a potential that he might have some liability or something like that on there. I've got a really great client. They totally get it. Um, they had a bad loss recently. There was a possibility we were at fault. We were waiting on some um, video from a nearby warehouse that may have captured the accident. They wanted to know what we do. Do we get our driver back on the road? What if this turns out to be really bad for him? They kept paying him. It, they kept paying him. You know, He was happy. It kept him participating. It kept him in the process. It, it, um, if we need him later for a deposition, if we need him to show up, you know, he's not just disappeared. Our attorneys can have so much trouble tracking down our driver and tracking down other people if we just send them packing, fire them, you know, on their way home from the hospital or wherever on the day of the accident. It makes it so much more difficult. So if you can, it's an expense, but please keep your drivers cooperative, 
keep them off the road until you're absolutely sure about what's going on. Keep them paid if you can. Get their cell phone from them. Get them a new one. Hmm. That's a good if, point. If it's something you're going to need it. I, I've had yeah. um, companies do that too. You know, explain why it, and let them know that, you know, we're there to support them. They, my defense attorney is defending our driver as well as the trucking company. So um, as long as we're reasonable, yeah, the, as long, yeah, go ahead, Oliver. The, the, the data issue is is dicey and I, we always run into, you know, not always, but often we have clients who are like, let's download it right now while it's fresh. And I'm like, well, here's, here's a, a real world problem. It wasn't in a, a commercial vehicle. It was in a, a passenger vehicle. Um, before I was involved in the case, a download was was uh, undertaken, and there was missing data in there. There was stuff you would have expected to be there that was not recoverable. And because plaintiff's counsel was not involved in the download, there's now an issue of, of building this narrative of, well, why is it so convenient that the speed of your vehicle is missing? for the quarter mile before the accident. Hmm. Why is it missing whether he applied the brakes or what steering angle was involved? Hmm. Now, I don't have an explanation as to why it wasn't recorded. It was a, a, a an electronic or mechanical hiccup or something. Nobody went in there. The people I was dealing with did not have the wherewithal to do this. I mean, it, it was thinking that they were going to go in and, and, you know, like manipulate this as kind of it's a pipe dream, but it sounds juicy and it is kind of fishy. Like, why is this missing? Everything else is here. Right. You know, so I always tell the clientele, you know, you need to be cognizant of the fact that you don't really know what's in that box mm -hmm. and it could be good or it could be bad. But we need to know what it is, and we need to know it in a way that its integrity can't really be effectively attacked. And that means all eyes are on it when the box gets opened. Mm -hmm. you know? Right. And had everyone been there at the time, and the, some of the data was missing, then everyone would know, you know, nothing was tampered with. But when you have it later down the road, mm -hmm. then everyone can invent their own mm -hmm. little, you know, conspiracy theories that will work against you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, yeah, it's always better just to wait and, <laughs> and just sit tight. Have someone record the process. I yes. paid just to have a, a single party there, you know, the $800 or, or whatever it is, just to record the process, you know, stand over, show exactly what each party is doing um, while they do it. So if any of that comes into question later, as far as someone overstepping their scope or someone trying to hide something, things like that. We have it all on camera so we can show that everything was was on the up and up with each side yeah so you know we've talked a lot about um you know responding you know when you get the call day one but there's always those situations that you don't get the call on day one you don't you might not even get it till day you know 180. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. does your response change and uh, yes i think the answer is yes but does your response change when you get the call you know months down the line even a year down the line oh yeah i think your response is come again <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't know if it's come again it might be a, a little more vulgar, vulgar than come again but <laughs> oh yeah oh there's there's nothing worse than finding out about a serious accident when your insured gets the suit papers in the mail or right. you know where yeah we were we just were sir or that my driver got this and he never reported it to us or something like that oh, what a nightmare I mean I, I had that happen earlier this year with a, a fatality and I'm like no one ever told me so <laughs> My insurance, we have a lot of conversations about calling me as soon as something happens, even if they don't have the details, but sometimes stuff happens and, and they don't uh, know about it right away or somebody in some terminal somewhere knows it, but they don't think that they need to move it up the line because they make a, a bad judgment call that, oh, we're not at fault or something like that. So, I mean, again, the, the first answer is the same, call your attorney um, and then you really have to uh, look into seeing, I mean, obviously the, the scene inspection thing might be gone, but there, might, there are still plenty of other things that you can um, do to, you know, try to, try to come back from behind and um, 
you know, you can coordinate with the other party, you can reach out to the other carriers, you can check and see if there's surveillance footage available, and you can um, go ahead and reach out to your insured to make sure that they've preserved at least uh, things like our driver DQ file, hours of service, this personnel file, um, truck file, things like that, um, GPS data, data um, things like that, that they may have um, to make sure that we're covering our bases from a preservation standpoint before anything else erodes. But yeah, it's much, it's much more difficult tracking down <laughs> witnesses, tracking down the driver to get a statement. Um, we, we can only do the best we can. Yeah. And that point too, you've probably, if you're more than 30, 45 days out, any sort of surveillance footage is probably out the window. And a lot of times, I mean, that can, that can mean everything in a case. If you, it it can make and break you. Um, but having it is helpful, even if it's bad news. (laughs) Well, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you, you just have to get what you can and then it's time to, to sit down and, and have that talk. Um, this honest appraisal of what's going on with this case and and what do we need to do? You know, it, if you're hearing about it 180 days later, um, well, chances are, it's probably something that was brought to your attention because it's not good for you. You know, you've got a suit, you've got something that you need to do. So, you know, do your investigation, get as much information as you can, and, and then, you know, take a look at it. Think, like the plaintiff attorney is thinking, you know, what, what are they looking at for you on it? And, you know, maybe you don't think that you, you did anything wrong, but um, they probably do. So you're going to need to uh, take a look at what evidence they might have in um, on you and, and see how you're going to, to need to react. In many, many, many cases, you know, my advice to my insureds when it's a, when it comes to fault or comparative fault is that, Number one, we need to be reasonable. So we need to start looking at this, look at the things we did right, look at the things we did wrong. If it's, if it's our fault, we need to own up to it. Um, you know, that's a strategy that'll come in handy and pay off in the courtroom when it comes to like combating reptile theory. Um, and we're gonna have to look at if maybe we are not accepting liability, is there something that we need to be accepting responsibility for? So. Later on, you know, we can ask if maybe there's something that the other side might need to be accepting responsibility for too, but we definitely want to come off as the, the reasonable person uh, in the room when it comes to, to handling that once we get to the point with negotiating damages. And it's, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, a lot of times when you have these, these very catastrophic um, incidents, you know, I'll, there's a lot of negotiation that can happen during the pre-litigation phase that can save save your clients you know money and and it which is especially important for self-insured clients when you know they're paying from dollar one um you know i always try to you know even if the liability is good or bad if there is an opportunity to resolve it pre-suit um and save them on defense costs and potential exposure I always think it's worth exploring. I think there's some people who take the stance like, oh no, there's not, we don't have enough information. Well, you have plenty of information to at least start the conversation. Maybe you can't resolve it, but it's worth a shot. Yeah, I mean, a- absolutely. And that's that's one thing that I think it takes some experience and some time for a claims adjuster to get to as far as a litigation management standpoint. Um, when you're new and you're first starting out, it's really easy to just let your attorney call all the shots. And I absolutely value the input from our attorneys, but I also wanna make sure that I'm doing right by my clients and I'm doing regular case evaluations, looking in my files and looking for opportunities that we might have to get something resolved early. Um, Sometimes it makes sense to go through the discovery process and then reach out to the other side and solicit a demand and see if you can schedule a mediation. Sometimes there are things that are fishy and you're probably gonna wanna go ahead and depose the other side and uh, you know, maybe get some surveillance on it or something like that. But you know, most claims aren't going to go to trial. You have to prepare everyone that it could go to trial um, and make sure that you've done all the work that you need to do if, for it to get up to that point. But really I'm gonna be looking at the claim frequently for opportunities that we might have to get it settled, mediation, early facilitation, something like that. Um, 
most of the time it's not necessary to go all the way up to you know the the trial and everything like that so um just make sure you're looking at what makes the most sense and um you know do we need an ime do we not need an ime are we definitely at fault okay let's resolve this you know right. let's get it settled so i'm i'm a big proponent of uh prevention as opposed to you know this proactive defensing you know, defense position so i do a lot of products liability uh, work as in addition to this this trucking stuff and in the products world i work with my clients to build adequate warnings uh, instruction manuals uh, protocols for reevaluating those things and protocols for training uh, it's mostly industrial equipment you're not born knowing how to use a, a punch press or a automatic welding machine or something like that. It needs to be well instructed. So if we can get that stuff ahead of time, get that locked in so we have good policies, it makes things a lot easier down the road. Are your uh, insureds embracing, you said they're tech savvy and I've, I've represented one trucking company that had, you know, for example, they had a tablet so that the driver's logs were always put into the tablet, automatically beamed to the cloud. Uh, none of the, like the old days where the guy's got a little spiral notebook and writes down and then <laughs> mysteriously he forgot to write it down or the, the notebook got coffee spilled all over it or it fell in a pile of, a puddle of diesel fuel or, you know, all the, these things. Um, so it's, it's clear, it's readily available and you can, you can freeze it in time so that there's no questions later on. Are, are you guys getting into that sort of thing? Absolutely, that is, that is such a great point. Um, for me as a claims adjuster, my work begins when I get the first notice of a loss. For my insurers who are trucking companies, their work to prevent catastrophic accidents, to prevent nuclear verdicts, that starts well before they even have an accident. It starts with their company safety policies, their driver training, their, the way that they make decisions about retraining drivers, the technology that they have. Oh man, every time I talk to a driver, or if he's in Louisiana, get a dash cam, please. And I have, like I mentioned, they are really tech savvy. I've got a great client in California. They've got forward facing dash cams. They've got left rear dash cams, right rear dash cams, dash cams on every single vehicle. Everything is logged automatically. Everything's electronic. So, so they're ready to go. Um, I have a client in Montana with a super, super great training facility. I mean, it's, it's like a thing that you get in to mimic a cab and they spend the time to train all their drivers. Not, not all trucking companies are taking the time to bring in their drivers and to, to train them. Um, I've seen clients that, uh, well, I've had accidents where, haven't I seen that name before? Didn't he have an accident about three months ago? Wait, let me look it up. Oh yeah, he had an accident three months ago. And then two months before that, why is he still working here? So these are things that, you know, the, the, a smart trucking company um, is, is gonna be looking at. If you've got a problem driver, then, you know, it's just a matter of time before they have a big loss and that's gonna come up in discovery. And that's not gonna be a good look for you when you get in the classroom. So there's absolutely a ton of work that you can do before you even have an accident to prevent an accident and to mitigate damages when something like that does happen and to, you know, be able to demonstrate that you did all of the right things because that's, that's going to be a big difference when it comes to getting it settled. And I, I also think a, a point, a point to discuss is, you know, you have a, a lot of these large um, well-known trucking companies, sometimes it, with the, you, you might want to resolve it pre-suit to keep their name out of suit because yes. <laughs> you don't want bad publicity <laughs> and you know sometimes that that is just a factor like it or not that's a factor that you have to weigh in mm -hmm. one nice thing about handling claims within the sir with my client's own money and not tied to another insurance company is if it's if it's a loss that appears to fall within the sir and they want me to handle it for them, even if it's not necessarily something that's covered by their excess indemnity contract, I can go ahead and handle it for it. So if hypothetically our driver gets out of a car and starts arguing with a young woman and punches her in the face, even though that's not a claim, um, 
I can handle it for them on their behalf. I can reach out to this person. I can establish it. I can pay it for the <laughs> trucking. I can get a, an NDA and a release and, and I can fix it for her and express how deeply sorry we are that it happened and make sure that that driver's not working for them again. Um, because it's a publicity thing and you, you don't want that getting out. Um, just, not just for that loss, but for future losses that you might have. So it's definitely something that they have to be cognizant of, even, even if they're not punching people in the face or things <laughs> like that. But it's definitely a consideration. Their reputation definitely means a lot. Now, we got a little off track from the, the first day's notice. So, um, you know, what would be your, your next steps after, I mean, we've talked about, you know, talking about possible resolution, you know, get your, your attorneys and your adjusters feet on the ground, getting the experts out there. Um, you know, what are the other pieces that we're missing that you would, the advice that you would give to um, another, a, maybe a younger claim specialist, about how to handle a catastrophic loss, you, you know, when you get notice of it right away, what are we missing? Um, well, there's one thing that I, I wanted to think of, and it's, um, it's not necessarily related to the injury or the serious part of the accident, but it is a serious expense, especially with, with semi-trucks. Um, we have a lot of fuel spills. We have, if a truck gets knocked over, if there's a lot of damage, we can have very, very, very expensive tow and cleanup bills. And I just wanted to remind any adjusters that those are negotiable. There are a lot of services out there that will work with you to very, very quickly um, reach out to the tow company and negotiate these down. Many of them will accept payment just as far as a percentage of the amount that they save you. And so don't just accept those for face value and pay them. Everything's negotiable. I had someone recently knock $30,000 off of a tow and uh, cleanup bill for me, for my client. Um, so you know, that, that's a big expense, but keep that in mind. Also, environmental spills, make sure you get an environmental specialist right away. If you have a diesel fuel, even if the accident's not your fault, if it's your truck, it's your responsibility to make sure that it's mitigated. And the EPA fees for not taking care of that properly are insane, thousands of dollars a day in many venues. So make sure that you get an environmental specialist if you feel that you have an environmental issue. Um, and this is going to be somebody different mo in most cases from your field adjuster. So you might have a, a lot of uh, cooks in that kitchen as far as who's working on resolving the claim, but that is, you've got to make sure that if you know, if there is a fuel spill, that that's being addressed in the right way. It, that's such a good point. Cause we often like get so focused on, you know, the, the injury portion and you forget about that. There's a lot of things on the other side that are not as much of the focus, but equally as important that are costs. I mean, they're costs for, for your, your self-insured clients, you know, that they, they're looking at, you know, paying themselves that we just don't know. It always falls. So you know, don't think about it as much. Yeah. And just like and storing a couple of years back at a, a crash, not too far from Philadelphia, where like, I want to say like 6,000 gallons of molasses spilled onto the, the highway. And it doesn't sound like it would be a, a terribly hazardous material. It, 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 if it gets into the, the water supply, uh, the, yep. the fish don't enjoy it very much. So uh, that was like a, a, I think it was a several week cleanup job. A very sticky it's not mess. always just diesel fuel yeah. and, and, you know, hazardous materials that are traditionally thought of as hazardous. I mean, um, any almost anything out of place can be costly. You know? Yeah, I had a big truck of molten aluminum once that went <laughs> off an overpass and just went everywhere. So that 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 was actually the one. Was there a video of that? Because I'd like to have seen the, the video oh, yeah. of a truckload of molten aluminum. <laughs> 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 yes, there was. <laughs> Fortunately, more and more. <laughs> Fortunately, I mean, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad when you're the one who's watching it, you know, all the time, because I, I've had a, it's, it's been a rough year for head on collisions and, and suicides and pedestrian losses and things like that. But, you know, it's good to have, even if you have to watch it, it's, it's a good thing to have it documented and prove that we did everything that we could to avoid it in, in many of those cases. Yeah. And I, I think, I mean, that is, you know, I think if we were to talk about the best piece of advice you could give um, your clients is I, I mean, in my eyes, it'd be tools to risk prevention mm -hmm. is number one. And 
we get that on the ground first, and then we'll deal with the, you know, when you get the claims that come in, that's step two, but que- step one is you have to advise and counsel your clients on how to prevent and um, prepare for risk. Yeah. So then step two is a little bit uh, easier to, you know, take on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And at our company, we have some really great safety personnel who work really closely with our clients. Um, I mentioned one of my clients had been having an issue with, with something I just had noticed. They've had a string of very similar losses. And within a week, our, our safety guy flew down there, sat with them, pulled out all their files on the floor. Like, here's what's going to happen if you get a DOT audit. And we're just going to go through everything, make sure you're organized, you know, and, and all your books are in order. And then they, he also sat down with them to discuss why this particular type of loss, it was an issue with the losing tires. Why does this keep happening? You know, um, to work with them, work with their mechanics and everything to, to try to prevent it because prevention is such a big part of, you know, what they need to be doing, especially when they're, they're taking on so many of those expenses. And especially if, when you have the same thing happening over and over and over and over again, and then someone gets killed. Oh yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. I mean- <laughs> if, if, I mean, it's a problem if you keep having tire issues and then, you know, someone gets killed from a, you know, a tire tread flying off of a semi and you have records that you don't, you know, inspect them and switch them out very often. It's a problem. <laughs> they only fly off from the country roads. Right? <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I do, you got you get 16 more tires. Come on. Yeah. You know, you know it, it happens. <laughs> um, Looking at trends is one thing that I do with my clients. So um, I'll do pretty regular claim reviews and it it depends. Sometimes we do it monthly, sometimes quarterly, but um, we, I keep track of kind of what category each kind of claim falls in. Is this a rear end collision? Is this a situation where we were changing lanes and it was a side swipe accident? Is a tire malfunction, things like that. And we'll break it down by their terminals and try to identify which terminals are having the the biggest issues. I'm like, oh, your Lexington or whatever terminal sure does seem to be having a lot of, you know, lane change side swipes where they're just are hitting people in their blind spot. So this is a training opportunity. This is something for you to get with your drivers and talk about um, making sure that they're handling these correctly. Or we're having a ton of right turn squeezes. Or are you doing jug handle turns? Are you doing button hook turns? You know, make sure you talk with drivers about the proper way to approach a right turn and making sure that they're watching who's behind them and who's ahead of them and which lanes that they're in to prevent those kind of accidents. So um, looking at the analytics and the things that we collect on the claims as they build up is something that we can go through and, and really dig into to try to keep those things from happening again and identify those trends. Yeah, and that's a great a great way to um, one identify risk and you know counsel counsel your clients on them and prevent it in the future. I love that. Um, I wish more. I wish it happened more. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the nice things about being you know a, um, a dedicated claim adjuster is that well, I just deal with these eleven companies, and so you know, I I get to see those same things over and over again. I recognize the driver name. I notice when I've gotten another, you know, rear end collision or lane change side swipe. So um, I think it, it, it's an extra service that we can provide, but it's also, you know, show, demonstrates the kind of relationship and one of the ways that the insurance company and the client can really partner together, you know, not just to handle these claims, but to work on claim prevention and work on making, them better, making the trunking company better because everybody wants to be safer. Nobody wants these things to happen. So um, just being able to have that relationship and being able to see those things over and over again is, is something that really helps us to, to improve that. Well, I love that. And I think it's like the perfect point to close on. <laughs> you, you summed it up so perfectly for me. Thank you. <laughs> this is a lot of fun. <laughs> well, I, I loved having you on today. I think this is, I, we had a very interesting conversation about handling large catastrophic claims. And I look forward to having you on for future episodes. We could talk, you, Rebecca, you sent me a large list of topics to talk about. So I'm really excited. Oh, you want to we... talk about claims? Here's about 15 things I'd like to talk about. She's like, yeah. okay. I'm like, let's, talk, let's pick topic one today. But no, I, I mentioned it to uh, 
Patricia, our managing partner, and she's like, have her be a regular. So I'd love it. Hope to have you come back. <laughs> be a lot <laughs> Thank, of fun. Thanks so much Oliver, for it was really nice talking to you too. Thank you so much. Yeah, good time. good meeting you. If, if you have if you have issues in PA, New York or New Jersey, you know Absolutely. how to reach us. Absolutely.